And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Willis for his COVID update. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning, supervisors. Good morning, community. Um, yes, we'll be focusing most of this update on, on that light that, that Matthew mentioned, the, the vaccine and our vaccine distribution plan. I want to start by also welcoming um, Supervisor Moulton Peters. Um, I'm remembering eight years ago, um, Supervisor, you were one of the first elected officials to visit me in my office that was then at 899 um, Northgate. Um, and I had been working in a primary care setting before that and didn't have a lot of experience as a public health officer. And it was interesting to me that an elected official paid a visit um, to public health. Um, and it was even more interesting to me and reassuring that, that you were interested in data um, and that we, uh, we had conversations about um, the health and well-being of Mill Valley and especially as an age-friendly community and the problem of, of substance use, especially among youth. Um, and I knew at that point that we had a, a public health champion and an elected seat. And I'm really glad to see that that, that seat is now functioning at the, at the county level. And as, as Larry and Garija Brilliant said, I think it's invaluable for us to have someone who understands and respects science, um, especially now in this pandemic response as, as a supervisor, as, the, as all of the other supervisors have been so valuable to us. So welcome. Um, and with that in mind, I've got some data to share um, regarding our, our COVID-19 uh, response. Um, if I could have my slides. Slide. Next slide. Okay. So this is um, our, our experience of the COVID-19 pandemic thus far in Marin, cumulatively. Um, you can see the slope of, of cases um, had plateaued there from um, about September through the beginning of, of, uh, of November, and now we're seeing a, an increase in the slope of cases coinciding with the surge that we're experiencing. We've had almost 8,000 cases now across our community um, with 111 deaths. That, that amounts to about one, one resident, you know, we're losing about one resident every three days on average since our first case and our first fatality in early March. Next, please. This is our, our website where anyone in the community can go and, and see it's, it's, it's covid19.marinehhs.org. Um, and it's, uh, it's, what this shows is that we've had over 260,000 tests performed, which almost equals our, our, our population as a county right now um, and, our, and, our, and our total number of cases in those recovered. Next, please. This is our epidemic curve. Uh, when we talk about flattening the curve, this is that graphic. It shows the number of cases per day based on when they were tested. Um, and what you see is um, the three waves that we've experienced, that subtle, subtle first wave in March um, that led to our first shelter in place and the closure of schools at that time. Um, and then we saw a, a much larger spike in July um, and now we are seeing an even greater um, spike in cases um, with that third wave that's being experienced in Marin across the Bay Area, the state, and in fact, the nation. Um, you see that that curve decreases there at the end, just in the end of December. We don't want to be falsely reassured by that. That is likely due to um, decreased testing that occurred over the Christmas holiday and then the following weekend. We always see reductions in testing um, around holiday times. Um, and you can see that last bar there, actually right at the end of December, after that holiday lull, was actually our greatest number of cases in any one day since the beginning of the pandemic with almost 130 cases in one day. Next, please. And this also just echoes what I was saying about the, the, the testing rates. This shows that we are steadily increased numbers of tests per day in Marin County. We are testing uh, almost 2,500 residents per day on average. Now we have just increased in more testing capacity through curative. Um, there's a new testing operation that will be opening uh, tomorrow on Wednesday uh, as a drive-through uh, that will be 600 tests per day. In addition to the curative sites that have been established across the county with 500 tests per day in five different locations on weekdays throughout the county. So we will see this num these numbers will increase by almost a thousand more cases, but more tests per day over the next couple of weeks. Next, please. And then this is the, the impact of that increase in transmission and case rates 
um, in terms of our, our hospitalizations and ICU stays. So um, you see there in, in July, this, this spike in, in hospitalizations we saw, that was importantly, one of the major contributors to that was the outbreak that occurred at San Quentin. Um, so the spike that we're seeing now is, is even greater, in, you know, relatively, because there are no, no San Quentin inmates now in the hospital. So this is by far the number, the highest number of, of our Marin County residents that we've seen in the hospitals at any point in the pandemic. Next, please. This is the state blueprint. Um, you know, thinking back a couple of months ago, this map of, of, of the state was a lot more, you know, yellow, red, and orange. Um, now it's essentially a purple state corresponding to the highest burden, the highest number of cases um, that we're seeing, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic across the state. Uh, you see there it's 93 cases per 100,000 residents per day. On average in the state, Marin County, it, that number is 28. So we're, despite the fact that we're seeing obvious surges here, our case rates are actually much lower than they are on average um, across the state of California. Next, please. This is, as you know, the governor has replaced the, the tier framework with, with a, a new set of policies uh, that are the stay at home policies that correspond rather than to case rates and, 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 hop, and uh, percent positivity, but actually correspond to hospital capacity and ICU capacity specifically. And the state has been divided into five regions. We are part of the Bay Area region. Four of those five regions now have ICU capacity of less than, six, less than 15% which is the trigger for imposing the state stay at home order. Um, that order will be lifted um, when the projected ICU capacity for any region is greater than 15%. Right now, our ICU capacity as a region is 7.9%. Actually, that was just updated today to being 6%. So we've seen a steady decline in our ICU capacity across the state and across the region. Um, next, please. And importantly, on that for that prior slide, um, the, the ICU capacity across the state of California is 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 zero. Um, if you take into account that that majority of the southern southern uh, all of Southern California and San Joaquin region have zero ICU capacity, um, this is our a graph that shows the ICU capacity in the, every region across the state. Those lowest. Uh, our, our Southern California and San Joaquin that ran out of ICU capacity in mid-December. You can see their blue line there, that's the Bay Area with a steady decline in ICU capacity again down to about 6% today. Next, please. Um, actually, before I get to vaccine distribution, just the last comment on the ICU capacity. Um, the state stay-at-home order um, is due to expire three weeks after it began. So that brings us to January 8th. Because of what I just showed in terms of the steady decline in ICU capacity, um, it does not look like we are going to be meeting criteria to have that stay-at-home order lifted um, on January 8th. Rather, actually, when we project out four weeks, it looks like we'll be having even less ICU capacity than we currently have based on surges in cases and increasing hospitalizations. So the state will, will issue that order when that time comes, the, 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 the numbers will be looked at on January 7th, um, but we should begin to um, you know, anticipate that we will not likely be coming out of the state stay-at-home order on January 8th. Um, and that's the experience that's being seen across the state of California. That order was extended in Southern California last week. So that's um, the good news. Um, is, is that we have a uh, vaccine has, has begun to flow um, across the nation and into Marin. We are now in our fourth week of a vaccine distribution plan. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about that, but I just wanna introduce the principles or the values that we're, that we're bringing to our vaccine distribution plan as a county under public health. Our goal is to protect all in Marin through an efficient, transparent and equitable COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine distribution and administration plan working in partnerships. As Matthew mentioned, one of the strengths and silver linings of our response thus far has been strengthening partnerships across the county, across sectors, working with education, with healthcare, with law enforcement, with our cities and towns, our businesses. And those are the rails that we will be riding upon as we uh, increase access to, to the vaccine 
as it's rolled out. Uh, we are also going to be responsive, recognizing that there's been a lot of changes. Um, this, the vaccine uh, warp speed has, has moved quickly um, and we're needing to be responsive every week. We've had, um, even in the four weeks of the vaccine distribution twice, we've had differences in the, the number of vaccines that we, were, that we were promised versus what we received. Just as an example of the way we're going to, need to be flexible and adaptive, adaptive in this plan, we're also emphasizing safety. We recognize there are concerns around the speed with which this vaccine came onto the market. We are confident in the scientific process that has verified its safety and efficacy, but we recognize that's an important principle to hold as we move forward. Open communication with our community, and then importantly, following federal and state guidelines. I think it's important for, for our community to recognize that only a certain decisions are actually up to the local jurisdiction. And most of what we do in terms of our vaccine distribution plan, it's determined by federal and state guidelines and standards. Next, please. And with that, I will introduce our, our vaccine distribution branch chief, Dr. Tyler Evans. Dr. Evans has joined us uh, from most recently New York City, where he has been uh, working on that city's quarantine and isolation plan. Um, Dr. Evans has a background in internal medicine and infectious diseases, has done a lot of work globally in uh, communicable disease control, outbreak control, um, vaccine distribution plans, working with Ebola in Africa um, and other infectious diseases, and is a, is a real find for us, um, has been a great addition to our team and an asset um, to really help us shepherd forward this entire new division and branch of our response, which is which is related to vaccines. Because at the same time as we're working on vaccine distribution, all of the other work that we've been doing is also equally important, if not more important, because we're seeing more and more cases. So the contact tracing efforts, our work with the hospitals, our work in policies, educating the community, um, testing, all those, all those domains of our response remain equally important and in fact are ramping up in their importance. So it was, it was invaluable for us to be able to bring on an expert like Dr. Evans to help lead the, the vaccine distribution plan. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Tyler. Thanks, Dr. Willis. Appreciate the introduction, and um, yeah, very, uh, very happy to be with um, be with you and, and Marin. You know, I, I often uh, sort of look at the world in a through a communicable disease lens, and um, and so you know, we often I often kind of look at um, you know I see kind of red spots and sort of blue spots, et cetera. Um, I think with with respect to COVID, you know, the um, that that really has been sort of evened out, and I think the the whole the whole world really kind of looks very similar, of course, with sort of concentrations of, of outbreaks, um, with re, which have really sort of amplified um, a lot of our chronic disparities. And that's, you know, that's something that we are uh, very mindful of. Um, and, you know, just to, to Dr. Willis's point, you know, um, a, a lot of what we're doing here um, is, um, is focusing on, on, on health equity. Um, so when it comes to our allegation, uh, distribution plan health equity is is a uh, um, is is a, a core ingredient of our of our planning. So uh, so with that, I'm just going to describe a little bit about um, the operation to date and sort of the plan uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. So um, you know the uh, you know many of many of you I'm, I'm sure have have been hearing sort of news reports um, across the. Um, across the country, locally, you know, wherever you get your news, um, hopefully not too much on social media. Um, and, um, you know, we are, um, we, we have essentially been given a roadmap, right, through, um, through the CDC's immunization branch, um, which is um, called ACIP, um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And so they essentially um, created a, a national sort of roadmap on, um, you know, what allocation or distribution should look like. Um, and those recommendations were then sort of picked up by, by the states. Um, obviously here, um, California Department of Public Health, um, you know, kind of took those, um, you know, took those guidelines and then created their own rubric in terms of what that, uh, what that would look like. Um, so um, so it's, it's been broken up nationally um, into different phases. So there's, and phase one is importantly, um, uh, distinguished into um, three different groups, phase 1A, B, C. And then to stratify it further, phase 1A, based upon California Department of Public Health guidelines, has been, um, 
has been further stratified into three tiers. So we are currently in, in the first tier. And so we first received vaccine um, on, uh, on December 16th. It was supposed to be December 14th. And, um, and, and what we've learned with, you know, with COVID and you know, certainly with vaccinations is, is no different is that you know, the, the goalpost is always changing and we just have to be as nimble as we possibly can. Um, so we, we received vaccines and um, you know, we had, we'd certainly been sort of anxiously anticipating them. And, um, and to great sort of fanfare, you know, we, we, we did start uh, distributing them in the, in the hospitals and, you know, we had a lot of sort of media moments and a lot of people were excited. Um, so I think a lot of people could understand that, you know, healthcare workers, particularly working in, in a, um, in, in, in hospitals and, and sort of, a, a, you know, working with acute disease, you know, are, are essentially at the highest risk. So we needed to, to, uh, to vaccinate them to protect them as quickly as we possibly could. So we did that and uh, I, we did it pretty well. Um, the relationships with the uh, leadership at, uh, you know, at the three main hospitals is, is an excellent relationship and we have um, great collaborative uh, capacity and our frequent communication. So that, so that part of it went very well. And, um, you know, that, that immunization, um, um, uh, initiative is, is, is still ongoing, but for the most part, um, it has been completed, um, with respect to the, uh, to the first, the first shots. And, and that was a combination of both Pfizer and, and Moderna, um, mostly Pfizer. Um, certainly the first week was all Pfizer. Um, and, uh, you know, in, importantly, and we'll get that, um, we'll, we'll get to this in, in a little bit, but, um, some of the hospitals, particularly Sutter and Kaiser, you know, UCSF, for example, these are um, what's what's referred to as multi-county um, entities, and so they are now actually being identified as their own sort of entity. And so, in terms of that distribution um, network uh, or distribution channel from the state, um, they are receiving their own. Uh, but the first week, um, everything came through us. Next slide, please. Um, and then within that same week, um, that was the first week and it, you know, it's, it's only a few weeks ago, but it, you know, it feels like months. Um, in that same week, we also, um, we launched a, a mobile, uh, a mobile unit, um, um, essentially canvassing the, the skilled nursing facilities and really what we were, we were prioritizing were the staff, right, because, um, you know, the residents in the skilled nursing facilities are, are, are primarily, you know, stationary. Um, so we really needed to cocoon these facilities as much as possible. And, and, you know, when we're dealing with most of the morbidity mortality nationwide, you know, this has been, um, you know, largely sort of concentrated in these facilities. So um, getting to these facilities was key and particularly getting to the staff. Uh, we did uh, really well. Uh, there was really great, um, uh, really great feedback. And, uh, and we vaccinated roughly 70% of the, of the staff uh, in that first week. Um, in terms of the additional staff, we did have a, we, we set up a pod or point of distribution where, uh, where a, um, uh, a, you know, a, a larger sort of group uh, was also a, able to come in. And we believe that we were able to vaccinate uh, a bit over 80% of, of the skilled nursing um, facility staff. Right. So just as I was kind of talking earlier, you know, the, uh, the allocation, um, you know, sort of list are based upon, you know, it goes from federal state to, to, to county or, or local health uh, department. And so, you know, the policies um, are set in a, in, in a much larger forest uh, than, than our own. And so we are, you know, we are largely um, the messenger. Um, and, you know, given that we try to do the best that we possibly can. U ultimately, our responsibility um, on the local level is to um, is to deliver the vaccines to the right people as quickly as we possibly can, and and ultimately our deliverable is to have as little vaccination at the end of the week or or at the beginning of the week, depending on you how you uh, perceive it, um, as, as little vaccination su um, supply as we as we possibly can. So we're we're really looking to have less than a hundred um, doses. So again, it's this is coming from you know this is well this is being. Um, the plan is, is coming from the ACIP, the, the CDC immunization branch, then down to state, then down to county. In terms of where the actual supplies are coming from, right now they're coming from Pfizer and Moderna. These are the two main vaccinations um, that have been approved through something called an EUA, emergency use authorization. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the pipeline, you know, has been open under something called Operation Warp Speed. 
Um, you know, there has been some slowdowns uh, in, in the past few weeks. Um, there has been some issues with inclement weather, um, you know, as well as, of course, uh, two important holidays, but we hope that to be ramping up soon. And again, you know, coming from the state, there are really, uh, there's, there's four main entities that are coming into California, and this is pretty much modeled throughout, throughout the country, but, um, you know, local health uh, departments or public health departments are receiving the, the lion's share, and then the MCEs, the multi-county entities like Kaiser, Sutter, UCSF are receiving their own um, dose supply. And then CVS Walgreens, many of you have, have probably heard, is, uh, has, has, um, has been uh, tapped by the CDC to, to have a national program uh, where they're covering long-term care facilities in general. So that included staff, but we really wanted to jump the gun. So we included the, we included the staff. We really wanted to, to get uh, to get them protected as quickly as possible. So we, we kind of did part of their job for them. Um, we've had, you know, uh, continuing conversations uh, with their, uh, you know, senior policymakers, and we understand that they are now uh, vaccinating the SNF residents, and we'll get to the residential care facilities for the elderly residents, um, uh, hopefully at, by within the next two to three weeks. And then, and then, and then finally, there's uh, CDCR, um, which is respond the sort of state um, allocation for San Quentin. Next slide, please. Um, and this just this just kind of you know gets a little bit more into um, to what our you know sort of daily operations um, are and and kind of where we're sort of taking orders from. Um, a, a lot of the data that we are that's that's shared with us is coming from the state level. We're in constant communication um, with uh, California Department of Public Health, and um, you know they really want to set up local health departments for um, for success. So they're hearing um, they're hearing sort of our feedback. You know this is all a very novel, innovative approach. You know we we've, we've been doing immunizations for a very long time, public health departments, but you know this of course is different and. Um, and we need to, you know, certainly ensure that we're maintaining that that equitable uh, lens. Um, but at the same time, states don't want to sort of create, you know, too much sort of interference in our uh, in our operations. So again, having that bi-directional sort of feedback is is really important. Um, and so, you know, Marin Public Health, we're really, you know, again, sort of responsible for coordinating. Um, you know, uh, redistribution, identifying, you know, clinical entities like hospitals who have the ability to vaccinate on their own. Uh, FQHCs are a good example. Uh, and really, you know, really just, just kind of uh, build capacity by ensuring that our partners um, are working uh, in tandem, you know, with us as, as much as we possibly can. And, uh, you know, strengthening, strengthening the, uh, the, the distributive networks in the county. Um, and, and throughout all of this, you know, again, we want to promote efficiency um, and, and transparency. Um, and, and, you know, one way we're doing that is, is actually setting up a community advisory board, uh, which is going to be uh, composed of a, a number of, uh, number of members. Um, it, we're, we're looking at somewhere between 20 to 25 folks who really represent different um, segments of the population, certainly uh, communities of color, uh, immigrant communities, LGBTQ, housing and security, um, uh, et cetera. So, um, so that's something that we're really excited uh, about doing. And, and, and this, uh, this advisory board, you know, will essentially serve in a bi-directional um, capacity, you know, providing an opportunity to give us guidance, um, but also, you know, kind of giving an opportunity for us to share, um, uh, you know, evidence and sort of principles of, of vaccination so that they can get that, that message out to the community. And, and that's something that's really, really important, um, identifying vaccine hesitancy and being aware of kind of where it, where it is and trying to address it as much as we possibly can. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, so with that, I mean, you know, data collection is something that's very, uh, very critical as well. You know, again, uh, much like everything in, in, in this sort of COVIDian storm, we've been building the plane as we've been flying. Uh, so we are, um, you know, we are, we are very in, in the sort of immediate operational stage, but at the same time, you know, we, we want our, our sort of air traffic controllers to, you know, sort of plan sort of next steps, et cetera. And throughout all that process, we want to collect the data to understand exactly what we've been doing and, and what's working and what's not. Uh, so we are um, definitely in that, that phase as well. And we want some of that data to be, you know, as, as sort of, you know, public facing as possible. Um, in the spirit of transparency. Um, and so, um, so this is real, where we are right now. We are in, you know, again, tier one, 
This is, you know, healthcare workers, um, particularly in hospitals, um, first responders, um, par particularly folks that are that are exposed to aerosolizing procedures, EMS, um, and uh, dialysis centers. And we have just been greenlighted to to also focus on tier two, uh, which we are uh, we, which we are starting this week, and that's including outpatient healthcare workers. And and in 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 an effort to do so, we are we are having you know sort of constant communication with them, including town halls and and community conversations. Next slide, please. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then getting to phase one B, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, sort of anxious anticipation for this. Uh, this is, this is also going to be including, this is the really the first sort of phase that's going to include the community. Um, you know, the, the phase one A is really broken down into different sort of tiers of, 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 you know, stratified based upon risk. That's really looking at, you know, sort of uh, based upon, you know, occupation, right? Sort of workers and, and their uh, relative risk factors. Phase 1B starts to, um, starts to cover the community at large, 75 and older uh, to begin with, which we know in, in Marin County is a sizable uh, 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 percentage. So, uh, so we're, we're working uh, with the community, with our clinical partners to really kind of help, uh, you know, ramp this up and and this is largely going to be through pods uh, points of distribution right now that's that's going to be at the Marin Center um, starting tomorrow next slide um, and then starting in late February uh, early March and again this you know this this is this is always subject to change so you know we put this on the website because we want the community to kind of understand you know where we're at but a lot of this a lot of this information again is is sort of filtered from from the federal and state, um, level. So we, we just, we, we're, we're trying to share that information as we receive it. So just, just please be sort of patient with, with some of these, uh, with some of these changes. Uh, but yeah, phase 1C is going to be, uh, is also going to be covering, you know, even a larger group, 65 to 74, and then 16 to 64, uh, with certain high-risk medical uh, comorbidities. So that's going to be a, a larger group as, as well. Next slide. You know, and then so later phases, phase two, um, which is uh, you know kind of a that that larger uh, that larger population, and, and we're you know we're getting into over the scale of over 100 million people, and then phase three, the sort of general population of of 18 and older at this point, uh, that's looking to be uh, to summer phase two, hopefully uh, starting around um, you know April May, but again this could this could uh, this could change. Next slide. And this is, you know, just in this again, the spirit of of transparency. Um, this is uh, th this is the, this is our dashboard. This is what we've received uh, so far, um, and this is this is what our allocation has looked like. Um, so basically, we've got we've got nearly thirteen thousand uh, that we have received uh, to date, um, and uh, you know, th there's there's also a, a number of doses that are that are being. Um, recovered from some of the hospitals who actually um, didn't need to use it, which is a good problem to have. So those are coming back to us and we should have a little bit in excess of 15,000 by the end of the week. Next slide. And then in terms of administration, you know, again, our ultimate endpoint is to, um, is to have, you know, really as, as, as little supply as we possibly can. Um, so by the end of the, the week, um, we should uh, be, have uh, roughly 14,300 uh, doses administered. So if, if you do the math, it's, it's essentially less than uh, less than 1,000, and, and we, we ideally would like to have less than 100 um, on, on hand. Next slide. So a lot of people sort of want to know, when is my turn? So, you know, really... You know, I, I know in the interest of time, we can't get too too much into this, but you know, just just kind of know what your tier is. Again, this is this is going to be on on the website. Know your tier, know your occupation, know your age, know your know your medical history, home environment. Uh, you know, and 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 just just be mindful of of that sort of tracking on the website, and we'll try to sort of give that information as as a. Uh, as you know, efficiently as we possibly can. Speak with your employers. Speak with your primary care providers. Um, you know, we're going to have a number of uh, opportunities for public audiences, community conversations, town halls, um, and then just be engaged with with the, with the county public health uh, websites as much as possible. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, where and how will this all happen? You know, most of this is is all going to be dependent on on this sort of central uh, point of distribution, but we are mindful that we, you know, we, we wanna ensure as much access as possible. So we probably will be setting up a few um, as well as a few mobile 
um, a, a few mobile opportunities and then working with, with clinical communities to, to really you know, provide as many sort of entry points as possible. Um, so just stay tuned. We are, you know, we, 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 we understand how important this is. And this is really, as, as a lot of folks have been saying, this is the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. So we are, we're excited to get this, get, get this to everyone. Uh, but we just, we just ask folks to be patient. We are, we are very mindful of, of where everybody else is in the queue. And, you know, we, we, we're going to keep having that conversation uh, with you guys. Um, next slide. So, um, you know, I think that that sort of summarizes uh, where we're at with vaccinations. You know, we are um, again in, in tier two, hope to be in tier three. And this, the state really would, would ideally like to, to be done with phase 1A uh, within the next week or two. So we're gonna do the best that we possibly can to, to get that done and then start phase 1B, you know, ho hopefully within, within a few weeks. So, um, so I'll just end there and, and give the floor back to Dr. Willis. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, yeah, so just to summarize, we are experiencing a surge in cases. Um, the stay-at-home order is still in effect. Our vaccine distribution is underway. Um, we have vaccinated over 6,000 individuals and plan to vaccinate another five to 6,000 over the next few days. Um, we're following a federal and state process for the vaccine distribution plan currently in phase 1A. Um, and our goal is to move vaccine into the community as quickly as it arrives. And with that, we will open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Evans and Dr. Willis. Uh, I think Damon has a question he'd like to ask. Yeah, and, and thanks for those reports and welcome, Dr. Evans. My questions are gonna focus on uh, the vaccine, so uh, perhaps directed to you. So. The question I think you kind of alluded to, it, but really to drill down a little bit more, is how will individuals in different priority groups or industries know when they can be vaccinated? In other words, is there a way to kind of get alerts or get on a list, or do community members simply need to kind of pay attention to what phase or in wh how, how more specifically can they stay apprised and get information? Yeah, I can, I think you muted Tyler. Yeah. I can start. Yeah, I mean, so the, uh, it depends on, on the, the reason that you're up. So if you, you know, some of it's based on employment. So your employer will know if, it, if it's phase 1B, for example, starts with um, educators as, uh, you know, school community teachers or, or early phase 1B. In that case, Marin County Office of Education, your school community, Will be notifying you that you're eligible at that time because the criteria for your being vaccinated based on your employment. At the same time, we'll be offering from a public health standpoint and in, 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 in public communications that we are now vaccinating people in that tier. So there should be a general awareness of that status as well. For those where your, your, your criteria is based on your health condition, for example, if those are age 75 or greater, your healthcare provider knows that about you. They know your chronic conditions. They have, they have electronic medical records where they can run queries of the entire panel of patients. And we'll use that as a, as a, as a way to invite people into vaccination based on those criteria. So there's, it's gonna be through your employer, through your healthcare provider and through public health channels. And then we'll be also partnering with media and US supervisors for your own distribution networks. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be, it's not gonna be a hidden, you know, there's no list, you don't need to worry that you need to get on a list to be notified. Um, you will be, you know, everyone, everyone in the county has a right to be vaccinated. It's free for everyone. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to identify yourself or raise your hand to be noticed. You're, you're, you're in, and it's just a matter of, you know, as we get doses, we'll get the word out and people can come and get vaccinated. Yeah, so just, really for, and we're hearing from community members, you know, justifiably concerned about missing out or, or being passed over. So what you're stating is there's nothing, no requirement to enroll in anything to receive confirmation about your priority group. It, this, will, this will evolve basically uh, through institutions like um, jobs, healthcare providers, community groups, um, certainly us, uh, HHS, uh, are we understanding that correctly? 
So, yeah, I, I can answer that. So um, yes, basically there's, there's, you know, as Dr. Willis had mentioned there, we, we have a really a multilateral approach to, to kind of getting this information out. Um, you know, some in terms of any sort of intentional actions that folks need to do. I mean, at this point, it's really just the clinical communities um, that once we green light them, again, we're in sort of tier two. So for example, working, working with the FQHCs to get them enrolled in something called COVID ready, um, which is, you know, a program that essentially um, provides an, an opportunity. It's a platform that provides an opportunity for them to be empowered so that they can actually be um, administrators. Um, so they can be their own kind of point of distribution. But in terms of like the general uh, community, the general population, there is nothing that they necessarily have to do other than just kind of, you know, have, a, have that conversation with their employer, right? Because this is all based upon sort of risk. So if, if, the, if your risk is based upon occupation, speaking to their employers, if their, um, if their level of risk is based upon their, 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 their housing sort of situation, if they're living in a congregate care facility, having that, that conversation, you know, with their sort of administrators, um, but, but ultimately, you know, just, just kind of, we will get the information to folks. Um, there's not necessarily much that they, they, they're sort of required to do, but I did want to mention, you know, in terms of the, the, the smaller groups that might not be clearly, um, highlighted, you know, in this rubric that's been provided on, and on the, the websites, this is one of the reasons why we have the community advisory group that we're, we're uh, community advisory board that we're, we're, um, assembling so that we kind of understand that this represents, you know, hopefully all the pillars of, of the community and they can kind of point us in the right direction if we are, if we are missing, um, you know, a particular sort of, you know, subpopulation or, or something like that. So. Um, yeah. So and appreciate that. A, a couple of specific examples have arisen, you know, just in, in the inquiries we're getting, for example, is the process different for say large corporations versus independent contractors? with a home office? Uh, would the latter group need to bring proof of employment? You know, what qualifies those, those kind of questions? Uh, we also have been hearing from unaffiliated physicians, which are obviously healthcare workers, essential, but maybe not affiliated with a larger group. How are they also getting access? So when we're getting to when we're getting to essential workers, for example, um, which is you know phase one B, um, if 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 they were in you know one of those categories, then then they essentially they they sign up, and this is all going to be through their employer. Um, let's say teachers, they would sign up, you know, through you know through their schools, um, and then they, they're they're signed up on on. Um, on something called prep mod and then they essentially come in so everybody has to be on this on this list it's just you know just just basically you know an online scheduler you come in the list and then you come in with your id um to to validate you know who you are and then we're working we're working on basically a a process where let's say you don't have your id or something like that our intention is not to 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 be sort of you know rule stricklers here we you know everybody needs to get vaccinated um, but we need to, you know, ensure again, sort of equity and, and, and principles here. So, um, so we'll have an opportunity where, for example, we can talk to their supervisor or, you know, or administrator and just kind of work through a validation process um, with that. We, we had some, some uh, examples with first responders and that seemed to work pretty well. So how about that independent contractor situation? Yeah. Um, you know, this is, this is, this is, again, this is, this is a lot of, we're, we're building the plane as, as we're, as we're flying. So we're, we're going to do, these are, these are situations where we're going to say, all right, this is, this is a group that we don't really understand yet how to validate, but we want to, again, you know, ensure that we are, um, you know, being, providing access, but, you know, at the same time, you know, ensuring there's, there's sort of veracity with respect to their, um, you know, with, with their profession and actually if they're, if they're at risk, but that's, that's, that's a tougher one. Yeah. We're, we're, we're thinking about it. Just a couple final questions. Um, and appreciate you kind of outlining how the, the rollout's going, um, where we're at in terms of how the vaccination distribution is going. Are we finding that, are we, are we, um, sitting on any unused vaccinate vaccines or um, are they pretty much getting administered as soon as we're getting them or shortly thereafter? Yeah. 
the, the moment the moment that we we basically get we get notified um, somewhere somewhere between uh, five to seven days ahead of time of you know of, of a certain batch that's coming in. Once that batch once we once we're uh, notified of that, then we have we have a, an ongoing almost a conveyor belt sort of model, uh, or or uh, more appropriately kind of a you know a, a a flight boarding sort of model where basically you have you know your different sort of uh, groups or, or tiers and you know and and we want the first group to sort of come in and while they're while they're still boarding having the sort of next group uh, line up and so they're they're in standby um, so we are we are you know again our, our, our primary endpoint from a local health de uh, department standpoint is to have as little supply as possible at the end of the week so our you know our kind of sort of QI deliverable is to have less than a hundred doses um, at the end of the week Great. And then final question. I know nationally uh, there's been some suggestion of late and it was recently reported on in the New York Times of, of potentially changing the tactic to provide a single dose vaccination. Is that being considered in Moran? Uh, it is. It's not at this time. Um, it's um, it's it, it's an interesting we, we've we've been hearing a lot of a lot of buzz about this. It, it's an interesting concept. Um, you know, I, I, I work, I've worked in a number of different countries and there's a lot of different perspectives out there. And I think we, I think it's good to be creative, um, and innovative in this, in this sort of time of, of emergency. But I also think it's important to really stick to the science and, um, and stick to the, um, to the relationships and the, um, and the trust that we have with the community. And right now we're really pushing evidence-based science and to sort of start deviating from that can create a lot of issues. So, you know, there, there's some, some of the principles, some of the immunization principles do make sense, but there's a lot of moving parts to that. And I, and I think it might create more damage than benefit. So, and, 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 and frankly, we couldn't even do it. I mean, this is something, this is something that's, you know, CDC really from a federal standpoint has to, has to authorize before we could even even do it. But the discussion is being made. You know, Matt and I have have discussed it. Um, you know, I, I'm always looking at innovative strategies, but this is something you really got to you really got to get right. And when there's a lot of folks, I think in, in our uh, you know in our society that that question the principles of science, I think it's even more important to really be as adherent to that as as we possibly can. Great, thanks, Supervisor Rice. Any questions? Okay. Supervisor Arnold, Supervisor Moulton Peters. Yes, please, just a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, thanks and compliments to Dr. Willis and Dr. Tyler for the data and for your very good interpretation, which is always so helpful. Uh, building on what Supervisor Connolly said, the, uh, the help uh, with getting the word out to the community on vaccinations is something that I know my district wants to do. If you have uh, language, uh, summary language and links to uh, some of the slides you think would be helpful that we can drop in our supervisors newsletters. Uh, you may do this already, but that would help, help me get the word out, particularly to those populations. And my family is a part that is not part of Kaiser and doesn't really get the word. Uh, from local practitioners um, reliably. So, uh, and then I just wanna compliment you on establishing the community advisory board with the two-way communication. That's a wonderful asset for everyone involved to facilitate communications, greater understanding, addressing some of the issues people may have with vaccination. So I, I compliment you to include that in your process. Thanks for today's report. Thank you. Uh, I think my question is for Dr. Willis. Uh, what can the public expect? Um, what's the next step at the, at the stay at home order? We know, we know it's not going to change probably in January, on January 9th, but what should the public expect as far as the state's order? And then uh, in terms of time, is there anything that you could share? Yes, um, we're, not, we're not expecting any um, obviously, we'll have to see what, what is announced when that time comes. Again, our order expires on the 8th of January. Um, we are not, there's no signaling yet that there would be any change in the policy itself that would accompany the order. It, 
And so what, what the decision point is the, is the duration of the order and not the contents of the order, if that makes sense. We're, we're, um, and we're looking to look, it's likely to be extended for us. Um, again, looking at that ICU capacity four weeks out. So right now that's the best I can offer is, is a simple extension of the likely extension of the order as it now stands. And would you expect that to be a four week interval or that's a little no, unclear? They, they, yeah, thank you for, for the opportunity to clarify that. It is, it is a little confusing. So when they look at ICU capacity four weeks out, um, that trend could actually start to reverse now and we could, and the order could be could be reversed much earlier. So let's let's imagine that on on January fifteenth, for example, our trend has changed. The the numbers start getting better, and that forecast has improved. On that date, the order could be lifted, um, even though it's 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 forecasting out into February's ICU capacity. Um, so you're you're constantly looking four weeks in advance to determine where that number's. Unfortunately, right now when we look four weeks in advance, the, the lines are going downward currently. Okay, thank you. Any final questions of either doctor? Okay, seeing none. Uh, uh, Matthew, do you have anything additional on your report? Nothing more, okay. Supervisor. Al, 